Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome. We're delighted Richard has battled through the runners and the traffic to be able to be here. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, my name's David Ison. I'm the Dean of the Cathedral here, and it's my privilege to introduce this session with Richard today. Um, Richard was the Bishop of Oxford after having been Dean of King's College London and uh, is simply one of the most distinguished Christian thinkers of our time, the kind of figure that uh, one longs to have on one's bench of bishops. His biography was called A, Head, A Heart in My Head, uh, putting the two together. And Rome Williams has called him one of the truly great and memorable figures of the 20th and 21st century in the Church of England. Honorary Professor of Theology at King's College London, cross-bench in the House of Lords, and made a bencher in the, in the House of Lords uh, because of his huge contribution in so many ways to the intellectual and moral life of this country. Uh, passionate and knowledgeable about a huge range of things, from nuclear disarmament to peace, justice, art, business, morality, social responsibility, stem cell research, embryology, and interfaith dialogue, among a whole host of other things. Um, and as a new bishop, and this is something that I, I don't think this is in bishop's training, as far as I'm aware, but as a new bishop, he took the church commissioners to court um, <laughs> for investing the church's money unethically. And although he lost, they still changed their policy as a result. Uh, author of over 20 academic and popular books. And he's here today to talk about this book and his experience of different uh, poets and playwrights and novelists who've meant so much to him to explore how literature can teach us about what it means to be both a human being and a person of faith. Richard is going to speak for about half an hour and then he and I are going to have 10 minutes of discussion before you uh, and then we'll open the floor to questions for the last 20 minutes. Um, Richard's book has sold out, I'm afraid, but we've managed to get some extra copies printed uh, to have today. So will you please welcome Bishop Richard Harris. Uh, good afternoon everybody. It's lovely to be here. I must make an apology. First of all, I'm not long out of hospital. Secondly, having sat in a taxi journey which should have taken 35 minutes and taken an hour and a half, so I'm feeling a bit frazzled. So if I sort of don't sound as articulate as you might hope, uh, please put it down to, uh, down to that. Now, like many of our generation, uh, we were into books from an early age. And I've always loved to be in books, first of all, because they take you into another world, and that world can, of course, be escapist. But I suppose I value books more than anything else because they, although they take you into another world, they actually illuminate the world in which we, we live. A good novel affects you. After a good novel, you, you sometimes feel differently about the world. You see the world in, different, in a different kind of ways. Now, I believe that every novel is written from a particular point of view. Now, of course, if the author tries to push that point of view too hard, we tend to lose interest because the characters become kind of cardboard cutout figures and the novel begins to appear simply a piece of propaganda. And we know that life is much more complex than that, that good and evil are very much mixed up together. Uh, and therefore, I think about a good novel, there would be a certain kind of ambiguity about it. It won't be obvious how you should read it. One of the most memorable occasions at the theatre was when I went to David Mamet's play called Oleana. Uh, it is a play about uh, a student who is accusing one of her lecturers of sexual harassment. And at the end of the play, my daughter and I realized we had seen the play through two totally different eyes. She had seen it through the eye of the student who alleged that, that she'd been harassed. I had actually seen it through the eyes of the lecturer who thought actually the student was manipulating him. Uh, it was a very, very interesting reaction. But I think that's one indication that actually it was really a very, very brilliant play. It wasn't very obvious which way you could, you could read it. 
And so I think in all kind of novels there will be this degree of kind of uh, ambigu ambiguity. Uh, and I think in that way it very much fits in with Jesus' dislike of a very sort of sharp divide between good and evil, a sort of excessive kind of moralism, dividing the world up into, into goodies and baddies. We all know that that is not like that at all. We're all a pretty good mixture of motives. Now, having said that, we shouldn't go make the opposite mistake and say uh, that uh, it would be quite wrong for novels to be written with no point of view. I think they are written from a point of view and it's interesting that, for instance, Philip Pullman uh, in his wonderful trilogy, he argued at the Edinburgh Literary Festival not long ago that all novels should contain what he called a moral clout. Now if he's allowed to write novels with a moral clout which has a very anti-religious standpoint then surely Christians ought to be able to write novels from a Christian point of view which also have a moral clout provided, as I say, they're not simply works of propaganda. Uh, I mean, and some, I'm afraid, Christian literature does fall into that category. I mean, um, a few years ago, moral rearmament was very much very, very active, and they produced some quite good stuff, but there was always something which was a little bit too cut and dried, I felt, about the th plays uh, which they, they put on. Now, another reason why I think that novels are particularly point of view from a, a Christian point of view uh, in the world in which we live, and that is, for so many people in our society, uh, Christianity has become a foreign language and what goes on in church is strange and alien. So how can you draw people into feeling something of the appeal of the Christian faith? I believe that literature is one of the ways in which we can do that. If you, if you, if you can draw people into a world in which the major characters actually have some kind of Christian faith but are living, vibrant, real people. You can draw people into at least begin to feel what it might be like to view the world from a Christian perspective. And that, of course, is one of the great strengths of Marilyn Robinson. I hope that some of you will have met some Marilyn Robinson, whom I discussed in my book and I'll be coming on to uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a minute or, or, or two. Just a word perhaps also about uh, poetry. Uh, poetry, I think, can also be very, very important from rather different point of view. Uh, so much of the language we, which we use is simply a kind of a linguistic sludge, isn't it? It's, if you examine your own thoughts sometimes, your own words, and it's, it's, it's really horrifying how much we're simply kind of recycling you know, what's there in, in, the, atm in the atmosphere. Uh, and what poetry can do, wonderfully expressed in those words of, of Eliot, can purify the dialect of the tribe, can bring a, a freshness to the language, particularly if the language about God has gone stale, it can bring a kind of freshness uh, to that. And that's a particular reason, I think, why poetry can be particularly important, particularly at the moment. Now, I've had a, an interest in novels all my life and poetry for a, a very great deal of it. And I suppose uh, that this work, which is subtitled, uh, Haunt, which is called Haunted by Christ, Modern Writers and the Struggle of, of, of Faith, basically reflects one of my kind of major, major interests. It's, all the writers in the book have meant a very great deal to me over the years. Now, I bring, begin with Dostoevsky, and you might say, well, is he really a modern writer? Yes, he is a modern writer, undoubtedly. He was the person who wrote the first psychological novels, for example, and he himself said that his faith had come through a furnace of doubt. And one of the themes which holds all these diverse novelists and poets together is that they have actually tried to express their work through a furnace of doubt, the furnace of doubt of our time, the questions, the radical questions which are being asked the whole time. Uh, they consider it in different kinds of, of, of ways, uh, but in one way or another uh, it, is, it is there. 
Now, of course, one of the great themes in Dostoevsky is the suffering of humanity. Uh, you may remember that extraordinary scene where Ivan Karamazov tells some horrific tales of the suffering of children and he turns to his brothers and says, it's not God I don't believe in Alyosha, just that I return him the ticket. The beginning of the moral protest against uh, God. Uh, and Ivan argues that however wonderful heaven might be, it cannot justify the kind of suffering of children which we have in this world. Challenge which is presented to the Christian faith, which of course has not gone away, which is still very much part of the th thinking of anybody who has seeks to go persevere with a faith, faith, a thought out faith in the kind of world in which, in which we, we live. And I think that brings out all a, an, another aspect uh, of the difficulty or the challenge of being a Christian believer in the modern world. It's not just the difficulty of believing things, but it is actually the moral objections which some people feel now to the Christian faith. Uh, Alec Vidler, a great uh, church historian, said uh, that the great ag Victorian agnostics turned away from the faith, not because of the rise of biblical criticism, not because of Darwin and evolution, but because what the church called upon them to believe with a sense of its own moral superiority struck them as morally inferior to their own highest beliefs and standards. And I think that's very much tr the case of many people. Today, they, they don't like what the Christian church teaches because not just the, because they find difficulty believing, they actually find some of it morally objectionable. And we have to actually face that and come to terms with it. So the theme of suffering in one way or another runs through all these uh, authors whom I have uh, discussed. Uh, and some of them do their best to, to actually come up with a, a, a Christian response uh, to that. Let me just, before coming on to that, let me just give one, one, one ex other example of, of the kind of people who've been affected. Samuel Beckett, I have a, a chapter on Samuel Beckett. You may be surprised that I got a chapter on Samuel Beckett. We might perhaps talk about that in, in, in the questions. But Har Har Harold Pinter uh, once suggested to Beckett that his writing was a, a constantly courageous attempt to impose <coughs> order and form upon the wretched mess of mankind has made of the world. Uh, and Beckett replied, if you insist on finding form, I'll describe it for you. I was in hospital once. There was a man in another, another ward dying of throat cancer. In the silence, I could hear his screams continually. That's the only kind of form my work has. So that Beckett, a wonderful, wonderful writer, one of my very favorite writers, that's at the heart of his work the sort of Christian, us frail, fallible, sensitive human beings responding to this, that kind of, uh, of, of world. Uh, in a different kind of way, that suffering is also there in Jared Manley Hopkins, on whom I have a, a chapter, particularly what is called his last terrible uh, sonnets, uh, when he was in Dublin, not feeling very, very well, going through what St. John of the Cross would have called a, a very, very dark night of the soul. And he says, pitched past pitch of grief, more per pangs still, uh, schooled at four pangs, wilder wi ring, comforter, where is your comforting? And then the poem con continues with these famous lines, oh the mind, mind has mountains, Cliffs of fall frightful, sheer, no man fathomed. Hold them cheap, may, who ne'er hung there. No worst, there is none, he wrote. A line which could have come straight from Samuel Beckett. So in one way or another, all the writers are, are on this theme, but some of them in, do, in fact, try to respond to it. One of my favourite responses, in fact, is from the poet W. H. Auden, on whom I have a, a, a chapter, uh, where he says in one of his poems, you can shake your fist as much as you like in anger 
or despair against the sky and all you'll hear back is the line bless what there is for being bless what there is for being however much you might rail against the world and the fact that it is so much so full of suffering as it is in the end his view was you have to bless what there is simply for for being that was his response um, uh, a pr rather more profound one an interesting one is that of, of Edwin Muir I have a chapter on what I call light from the Orkneys two remarkable poets from the Or Orkneys Edwin Muir uh, and jo George Mackay Brown uh, and Edwin Muir compares the Garden of Eden the paradise the innocent paradise of Eden with the kind of world in which we live uh, now with what he calls this its darkened fields but he then says what has Eden ever to know of faith and hope and pity and love strange blessings never in paradise fall from these beclouded skies I think it's the most wonderful wonderful lines of Christian poetry over the last few hundred y years He's, he's arguing that faith and love and pity and hope can only come from the kind of world in which we have strange blessings never in paradise fall from these beclouded uh, skies so the theme of suffering uh, and novelists and poets attempts in one way or another to come to terms with this from the standpoint of their Christian faith that's one of the major themes running through uh, this book another one is uh, is uh, beauty because this world is not only one of horror it is also one of uh, of beauty and I have a chapter in the book on Edward Thomas which some people might find surprising because Edward Thomas wasn't in fact a a religious man he wrote the most wonderful wonderful poetry but he wasn't a religious man and he, actually he was very ignorant of religion and he he knew he was and he he belonged to a generation which really a, a, a generation of intellectuals at that time sort of just before the first world war really who who had no time for the Christian faith at all but there is in his poetry what I call an elusive call there's a kind of haunting note about Edward Thomas's poetry so he's yearning for something just beyond the horizon something he can't quite quite reach and that interests me very very much because many people are conscious of that perhaps everybody here has had that feeling one time or another through experiences of beauty beauty either in nature or art or in music we get sort of sort of taken beyond ourselves and out of ourselves and there's something tantalizing which we can never quite grasp now what are we to make of this this feeling is it just a sort of hangover from a kind of late romanticism was Edward Thomas just a kind of late romantic that's the last bit of of that late Victorian romanticism or what what it is but a very interesting response uh, to that kind of feeling comes with C.S. Lewis because he too was haunted by it all his life he didn't quite know what to make of it and in the end as you perhaps know he came to interpret it in Christian uh, terms in one of his most in my favorite essay of, of C.S. Lewis a wonderful wartime e essay uh, Lewis writes about glory in these words we don't want merely to see beauty we want something else that can hardly be put into words to be united to the beauty we want to see to pass into it to receive it into ourselves to bathe in it to become part of it and he suggests that this is what we see in the myths of gods and goddesses and in the biblical picture of heaven at present he writes we cannot mingle with the pleasures splendors we see but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that it will not always be so we are summoned to pass through pass in through nature beyond her into that splendor which she fitfully uh, reflects now Thomas ended one of his poems called glory interestingly enough we cannot bite the day to the core what a very vivid image 
of that tantalizing quality of beauty. We cannot bite the day to the core. There's always something beyond. But what C.S. Lewis is saying, no, we, we can't, we can't in this world, but one day we will, we will, as it were, become part of beauty and beauty will become part of us. So that's why I included Thomas uh, in the book, because he raises for me that very, very interesting question. What do we make, what are we to make uh, of these uh, kind of feelings and the elusive call which we see in his poetry which is sometimes symbolized in bo birds or sometimes in other things uh, how are we to interpret that so suffering in was theme and a, the and a response to it by some of the authors uh, beauty that that sense of being haunted by, by beauty is another theme that runs through it a third one is simply grace is it Grace is strongly present uh, in all the authors I've discussed, but it comes to a head particularly in a chapter I've written called Grace in Failure, where I discuss four Roman Catholic novelists, uh, Graham Greene, uh, Evelyn Waugh, the American novelist, Roman Catholic novelist who wrote in the deep fundamentalist south of America, Flannery O'Connor, and the Jap Japanese uh, novelist, Shisuko uh, Endo, uh, and I discuss one of each of their novels. And each of their novels is about failure. Perhaps the most famous is Gray and Green's uh, *The Power and the Glory*, about a, a drunken failure cre uh, priest. And some of you are nodding your heads because you will have read it. It's been very, very famous in its way. A priest who, in one way, was a total failure. He was an alcoholic. He had a mistress, but nevertheless. He tried to fulfill his vocation and bring the sacraments to people, even in a, uh, a country ridden with civil war where the church was being actively uh, persecuted. But the novel that I in particularly uh, uh, discuss, in the, well, I discuss all of them, but one of them in, that I think is particularly powerful is by the J Japanese novelist Shisuko Endo. I don't know, did any of you ever see his film called The Silence? Uh, one or two people novel uh, uh, nodding about about that. Shusuka Endo writes about the period in Japan in the 17th century, when after the very very successful Christian mission, the uh, Japanese rulers turned against the Christian Church in a very very bitter and cruel way, and started uh, to uh, basically to kill off all Christians. And the silence, which was made into this this film by that well-known film producer who goes in for violence in a rather big way which I don't really like but uh, what, was his, what was his name of the producer? P producer? Scorsese. Hmm? Scorsese, that's right, Scorsese. So there's a lot of violence in it um, uh, and it's a very very powerful film but actually the novel I prefer is called The, the Samurai um, and The Samurai is about uh, four samurai or minor gentry uh, who are returning to uh, Japan uh, and traveling with them as an interpreter is a Jesuit priest and as the politics of Japan fluctuate the samurai first embrace the Christian faith and then abandon it and because they'd earlier embraced it they went back to Japan knowing that torture and death awaited them and in Mexico the mission came across a strange man a Japanese living with the Indians it turned out he'd been brought up in Japan by a Christian priest and himself become a believer, indeed a monk. But he'd become disillusioned with the institutional church, both in Japan and Mexico, and now lived with the Indians, trying to help them as best he could. As he says, wherever the Indians go, I shall go. Where they stay, I shall stay. They need someone like me to wipe off their sweat when they're ill to hold their hands at the moment of death. The Indians and I, we are both without a home. And when the samurai uh, go home, one of them pulls out a piece of paper given him by that strange Japanese and written on it with the words, he is always beside us. He listens to our agony and grief. He weeps with us and says to us, blessed are they who weep in this life for in the kingdom of heaven they shall smile. Then he reflects, he was that man with the drooping head, that man as scrawny as a pin, that man whose arms stretched lifelessly out, nailed to a cross. 
For some reason, he didn't feel the same contempt for him he'd have felt before. In fact, it seemed as though that wretched man was much like himself as he sat abstractly by the half. And later he speaks to his servant Yoso, a Christian who'd followed his master through thick and thin. I suppose that somewhere in the hearts of men, there is a yearning for someone who will be with you throughout your life. Someone who will never betray you, never leave you, even if that someone is just a sick, mangy dog. That man became just such a miserable dog for the sake of mankind. Then the samurai leaves his home for virtually certain death. The swirling flakes seem like the white swans of the marshlands, birds of passage which came to the marshland from a distant country and then departed for a distant country, birds which had seen many countries, many cities. They were himself, and now he was sitting off for another unknown land. From now on, he will be beside you. Suddenly he heard Yoso's strained voice behind him. From now on, he will attend you. And I found that book very, very powerful uh, in, in, indeed. And I think it brings out this w divine grace in the way it works in us in times of the most abject failure and breakdown of society or, or ourselves. Now one of the other people in whom grace is very apparent in their writing is the poet Elizabeth Jennings. Um, it's interesting, a new biographer has just been published. I very much hope that she might come into, into favour. Now she lived a very ordinary kind of life, living in Oxford. She didn't have an easy time. She had a number of mental breakdowns in her time. She wrote very moving poetry about being in a mental hospital, about the kind of people she saw around about her. And she knew, her, she knew that she herself was a difficult person. She knew, you know, that she could alienate her, her friends. But what you see in her poetry uh, is divine grace working in her and through her so that she moves away from a kind of self-absorption with herself into an ability to be able to appreciate and, uh, and praise the world around her. Well, one of the moments, poems of hers I particularly like is called Moments of Grace because she sees flashes of grace in so many aspects of her life. And particularly successful, I think, is this one. I count the moments of my mercies up. I make a list of love and find it full. I do all this before I fall asleep. Others examine consciences. I tell my beads of gracious moments shining still. I count my good hours and they guide me well. I love that line. I tell my beads of gracious moments shining still. It's a lovely thought to go to sleep on, isn't it? <laughs> I recommend it, particularly if you're feeling in a bad mood. <laughs> um, and so uh, it, you see her in that poetry working away from kind of self-absorption to this ability to, to notice grace in the world around her and this leads to gratitude and praise. Uh, and she says uh, in, in, one, uh, in, in uh, one point, I want a music of pure thankfulness. And her 1998 collection of poems is simply called Praises. Uh, she has poems about nature and all its aspects, changing seasons, etc., etc. And like Rupert Brooke in his poem, The Great Love, some of you might know Rupert Brooke's poem. It's a great, lovely, great fun, all the things that he really loves. Uh, uh, the, these, uh, jo Jennings has a similar kind of a poem, which is just as, great, just as great fun. She writes, I praise those things I always take for granted. The tap my sister turns on for my bath every time I stay. The safety pin, and who invented it? I don't know. The comb, the piece of soap, a shoe, its shine. I praise the yawning kind of sleep that's coming and where the spirit goes, the sheet, the pillow. So nothing is too ordinary. Uh, that You might say this is the precious ordinary which she wants to give praise for. Now, 
I see we're going on a bit rather than longer than I thought, but I better just say one or two more things about uh, the themes. One of them is hell and redemption. Um, this is a theme both in Stevie Smith, I have a chapter on Stevie Smith, a wonderful, fun poet who loved the Christian faith. She loved the Anglican liturgy, but in the end she came, she couldn't believe it because of its teaching on hell. She believed that if you looked at the New Testament, you couldn't escape the fact that it taught the reality of hell, uh, and that made her disbelieve it. Now, in contrast to that, uh, there's an amazing passage from T.S. Eliot. I have a chapter on T.S. Eliot, which poses three questions. Uh, Eliot, as you probably know, did a dramatic conversion to the Christian faith in 1927, uh, and I, his, all his letters for around that period have now been published and you can see what was going on in his mind at the time. And I posed three questions in that chapel. From what did he convert? Why did he convert? And what difference did it make? Um, um, as part of the conversion process, uh, he had made a good friend with an American scholar called Paul Moore. He greatly admired Paul Moore, who was a very good scholar, uh, and they got on very well. Uh, but he was very shocked uh, about the fact that Paul Moore didn't believe in hell. Is your God Santa Claus, he asked and continued, to be damned for the glory of God is sense, not paradox. And then he has a very interesting passage justifying a belief in hell. The man who disbelieves in any future life, whatever, is also a believer in hell. For in this life one makes now and then important decisions, or at least allows circumstances to decide, and some of these decisions are such as to have consequences for the rest of our mortal life. Some people find themselves consequently in circumstances such that the whole of their mortal life must be a torment to them. And if there is no future life in hell, then hell is for such people here and now. And I can see nothing worse than a hell which endures, endures to eternity and a hell which endures until mere annihilation, the mere stretch of endless time, which is the only way in which we can ordinarily apprehend immortal life, seems to me to make no difference. People go to hell, I take it, because they choose to. They cannot get out because they cannot change themselves. And Eliot knew what he was talking about because he was living through a personal hell, not just a kind of cultural hell of the 1920s and 30s, the terrible mess it was in, but he'd made this very, very unhappy marriage, tragic to both him and his wife. Uh, she suffered from very, very severe uh, mental, mental illness, and it really was hell for both of them. And at the same time, he was trying to earn a living to pay her medical bills and to keep up his literary work. So he knew what he was talking about. No doubt that was one of the reasons why he, he, he came to believe the Christian faith because he needed something to hold his, his life, uh, his life uh, together. Now, so there's a very interesting contrast between what Eliot is saying there. Uh, he's basically saying, you know, we make hell for ourselves by our bad decisions and it makes no difference whether actually there's nothing morally different about whether that hell's in this life or the future life because, you know, our actions have consequences for which we have to take responsibility. Um, and then let me just say one more thing on, 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 in relation to that. What about redemption? Well, I think if one looks, looks for redemption in the mob, modern novels, I'd look above all to the novels of William Golding, and in particular to his amazing novel, Pincher Martin. Pincher Martin is ostensibly about a man who's drowning and managed to, somehow to clutch onto a rock, and the whole novel is him trying to clutch onto the rock in order to save his life. But towards the end, you suddenly begin to see differently. There's a very, very interesting twist towards the end. And this is how the novel ends. The lightning crept in. The centre was unaware of anything but the claws and the threat. It focused its awareness on the crumbled serrations and the blazing red. The lightning came forward. Some of the lines pointed to the centre, waiting for the moment when they could pierce it. Others lay against the claws, 
playing over them, prying for a weakness, wearing them away in a compassion that was timeless and without mercy. It's a very vivid image of the self as a pair of lobster claws being worn away but by a love that never gives in. What was outwardly was a struggle to stay alive was inwardly a struggle to, to resist what he calls that compassion that was timeless and without mercy. And then, this is my final point, and I will then look to you, David, to take us forward a little bit. I said there's a chapter on uh, Marilyn Robinson, and I picked more, look, Marilyn Robinson in particular. I mean, it's a, a very, very important, great read, because one of the issues, I think, for Christians today is, as I said before, is that it is a foreign language. So how do you, how do you get people into a world where the look, talk about the Christian faith seems natural, not something which is strained, which is dragged into the conversation? Well, Marilyn Robinson has been very clever because what she has picked on is a family of American pastors living in the Midwest in Iowa. And she tells the story of these pastors over three generations and all they go, go through, including the, Mabel, including the American Civil War and how they respond to the suffering of, the, of, of their times. And because of these are, are good men and they're learned men in the Christian faith, if you get it drawn into the novel, you begin to see that the, their kind of theological talk is very natural. Maybe not to, natural to our age, but it is natural to their age, and if you get drawn into those characters, you get drawn into, the, into how, how it is that they can kind of see the world in this kind of Christian or, or theological way. So that's the, fi first, that's the final reason then why I think the, these writers are, are important, because, because actually they, they can give us a kind of language in which the Christian faith begins to actually make sense for people today. So David, perhaps you and I could have a few minutes together before we open up to the congregation. Very much look forward to hearing you know, what you have to say and particularly if you want to respond to any of those particular novelists that, that you know or like. So David. Richard, would you like to come and sit down at the table? And one of the fascinating things about the book is the way that we see the authors, see the authors through Richard eyes, Richard's eyes. Eh? Oh, Richard, that's not wrong. Um, and in your introduction, you talked about the importance of having empathetic, imaginative power, mm. and the way that Christians should understand atheism, and atheists need to understand Christianity to enter into the reality of what it was. And I wonder what it had meant for you to engage with the full force of atheism for yourself. Yes, I do feel very... Can, I, can, can, can you hear all right if we sit down all right? Yes. You, don't, yes. you don't need to look at me. No, you can hear me. <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, I, I believe that very, very strongly. Uh, uh, and particularly, I think, the challenge of suffering and evil uh, I believe as Christians w we will certainly be aware of that and I think I would take the same view as T.S. Eliot that the more mature your faith is the more sharply you are aware to the challenge presented by the objections to it it's not as though you're aware of these these objections or these challenges to faith and you have faith and some how the challenges go away. Rather, you, 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 your faith, you, have, you have your faith, your faith grows, but those it makes you even more aware uh, of, the, of the challenges. They don't, they don't dissolve your faith, but you're just aware of them. And that's why it's, it's always a mistake to think that there's a final knockdown answer to some of the challenges presented by the Christian faith. And I think it is in the novels of people like, like Camus, my first came across as an undergraduate at Cambridge, uh, his great novel, The Plague, uh, where at the centre of the book is an atheist doctor, Dr. Rio, uh, and juxtaposed with him is a Christian piece, uh, Fa Father Panalu. And they're both working in a children's hospital where children are suffering. Uh, and. Uh, Dr. Rio says, I can never lo love a scheme of things in which children are allowed to suffer like, like that. So, 
So I, I think that, that, it, that, that is always part, has always, you know, it's part of my faith and it remain, doesn't, I don't think it goes, goes away. And it doesn't mean to say that your, your faith dissolves, it just it is, it is always there in juxtaposition to the faith, I'd say. Thank you. Um, the, the other general point I wanted to ask you about was that you quote Emily Dickinson about Tell It Slant and most of the authors you engage with in, in one way or another are looking at things from a, an off-centre point of view. Mm. Uh, you've been at the centre of the establishment for very many years um, as a bishop, as a peer and so on. How do you hold together being in the centre of where things are in, as well as telling it slant? Well, I, I think, I mean, that raises other questions as well, not just questions of language, but the questions of, uh, of you know, where one is situated. Uh, I, I had a blissfully happy time as a curate in Hampstead for six years. You could, I could have stayed there forever. So, you know, it was a kind of hell on earth, surrounded by beautiful, intelligent young people. You know, what more do you want as a young curate? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but you, know, you know, I began to realize, you know, if, if I'd stayed there any longer, I would have adopted a Hampstead perspective on life. Well, that's, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, it's just not real. That's not, that's not the, it's not how, how most, you know, how most of the world is. And I suppose the short answer is by trying to remind myself the whole time that actually how the world lives and where the lives, world lives and what they have to struggle with is very different from where I am. And I think, I suppose, try to remind myself of that imaginatively and prayerfully, uh, as I'm sure we, as I'm sure we all do. Uh, and, uh, a word which comes to mind, I know it's a little bit cliched, it's the word is solidarity, uh, somehow to stand in solidarity uh, with, with people. Which reminds me of a, a little funny, funny story, apparently uh, Mrs. Thatcher went up to Liverpool at the time of you know, all the difficulties she was having with the church and heard a Methodist preacher preaching uh, uh, and uh, Dennis apparently turned to, to Margaret and said, uh, Solidarity, solidarity, uh, uh, dear, dear. I don't think that's one of our words, is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would say that it is, should be one of the words, words for, 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 for Chris. That, that in some way, beginning prayerfully, standing with people who are losing out in the world as it is now. For me, it came to a focus in a, in a book I once wrote called Is There a Gospel for the Rich? I mean, Jesus, it's quite clear that the New, the, the New Testament, the church belongs to the poor. And there's no doubt about that. That's absolutely crystal clear in the New Testament. So if you're rich, if you're rich like me, or even the Dana Dean of St. Paul's, it's just not part, <laughs> part, of, part, of the, part of the establishment. I don't mean in monetary terms, but I mean part of this establishment, you know. So how, 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 do, how do we become one of the poor who bless? How do we become one of the poor to whom the kingdom of God belongs, as Jesus said? Well, it we seems to me the only way in some way or another is, is, is to stand beginning prayerfully with those people who lose out now. The, anyway. Thank you. Um, let's open it up to some questions from the floor. Has anyone got a question they'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Well, uh, I, I, but, but, books I hear are coming back into fashion, first of all. Books are doing much better now than they were. Poetry is coming back into fashion, that's all good. Now clearly films is another whole genre, I'm, although I love good films, I'm not an expert on films, I wouldn't believe in, you know, uh, uh, dream of saying anything in relation to the world of film. But we knew, need Christians who love films and who love that whole visual world, who write about it and about what, what goes, goes on in it. Um, I think I would say as a general point, one of the r really wonderful things about uh, the arts uh, and the modern world is the number of, of major composers in recent world, years you know, who are writing music from a Christian point of view. There are some poets and there are some, some novelists. Uh, I don't think any of them uh, have, have reached the sort of stature of Marilyn Robinson yet. I, one, of the, one of the reviews of my book said, you know, why haven't I mentioned uh, Michael Arditi, for example, and Sa Sally Vickers, both of whom I've read. And I quite like their novels, but I don't think they're 
They're quite, quite there, but you may have some other people I should have mentioned. But uh, there, are many different, there are many different kind of forms, uh, and I think books will continue to be one. And books, because make us, uh, are, are important for taking us into, into worlds which may not have any, anything to do with Christianity, but at least help us to understand in which we, w the world in which we live. And this amazing new novel novelist called Sally Rooney, anybody reading it, Sally Rooney? It's called The Voice of the New Generation, a second novel called no Normal People. It's about the world of, of young people. And from my point of view, it's a pretty bleak world, and there are no fixed boundaries, a lot of sex, fair amount of drugs, certain amount, quite a lot of nastiness. You wonder what, what's going on in this, in this world. I mean, she's a brilliant writer, and she takes you into... What there seems to be in that world is a, is a desire amongst some of the major characters for what we can only call as the authentic, something which is real. They seem to be looking for something which is real. But I, I found that very important to read that world, but because it helps one to understand the kind of world in which... We live in the world of my grandchildren, for example. Uh, well, of course, this is another subject, but I'm very happy to address it on the whole question of the new. Like you, I very much lament the fact that that very one hard, very hard one treaty. Uh, at the end of the Cold War uh, to limit intermediate range nuclear missiles, particularly in Europe. Uh, that was a great, that was an important achievement. I very much regret the fact that both the United States and Russia are now withdrawing from it. I regard this as a very, 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 very unhelpful move, move indeed. Um, I, I mean, I don't particularly want to get onto the subject of British nuclear weapons, but I I mean, in the past, I've been a support at the height of the Cold War. There was a strong case for nuclear deter deterrence, which we needn't go into now. But I think now, the, whether we should retain an independent nu nuclear deterrent ourselves, when we could actually use that money for so much better purpose, not least actually to equip our conventional forces in a rather rather better way. Um, but uh, the Church, uh, I mean, the Church of England has been divided on the nuclear issue, of course, as it has on so many, so many other things. But there's n we're all totally agreed that we need to try to keep to the non-proliferation treaty. We need to try to make that work. We need to try to get deals with Korea and with Iran, uh, and we need to set an example, you know, in our own sphere in Europe. Can I ask you a question about uh, the chapter on uh, C.S. Lewis and Philip Pullman? Yeah. And you talked earlier about the way in which the later Victorians tended to view uh, the church's morality as inferior yeah. to theirs. And um, one of the things I felt that wasn't quite so clear in the chapter was about C.S. Lewis's experience of the First and Second World Wars right. Right. and engagement with that, and wondering whether the later Elizabethans are also going down the road of the later Victorians in terms of having lived through a period of relative prosperity mm. and therefore having a fairly settled view of the world, whereas Lewis's view was actually shaped by something much more evil and bleak that he yeah. saw going on around him. Um, and whether some of the, the things that you're discussing and the authors that you come across is part of the context in which we are at the moment. You talk a lot about Lewis's context. You don't talk so much about Philip Pullman's context yeah. in the later 20th century and whether this is a phase that we're living through at the moment which will then turn on to something else but there's a fairly optimistic phase about how we can make the world better how we can look after ourselves better how we can be more stoical about it because of the the lack of confrontation with evil well I think you're absolutely right first of all we need to try to be as aware we can of the kind of cultural mood of our times uh, and we need first of all to be aware of it uh, and the first step toward becoming aware of it is to be aware that every age of course has its own cultural mood and that's one of the great things about having a tradition as we do in the church you know you don't ca get caught up in the fashion we can view it from the standpoint of you know the great saints down the ages and the different pages of, of church history uh, of, and, and of history as a, as a whole um, I did one of those things that people my age do occasionally, 
uh, and that is I, I wrote to my three grandchildren so, what, what I called a New Year's letter, beginning by this is the kind of thing that grandparents write to their grandchildren. <laughs> so a sort of history of my times. And to shut up, I gave them a sort of history of, of the cultural mood from the end of the First World War until where we are now. And I basically, I wanted to bring home to my grand grandchildren the simple fact that all our lifetime, at least particularly since the first, Second World War, we've lived on the basis of hope that the world can be get better, that we can change the world and we can make the world better. We've shaped that by conviction. I think that, that the next generation now has a very different, more difficult challenge, that is actually to stop things getting worse. That's, that's, I think that's the first challenge, but I'm not sure that they've really woken up to it. I, I mean, obviously, young, certainly my grandchildren, they're, you know, they're lovely people, they're optimistic personally, and of course they think they can, they can do things with their lives to make the world better, they do, but actually, uh, I, I think there is, there is a significant change now. Uh, and um, so, I, but in particular, you thought whether we weren't aware of the reali reality of evil, and I think that is, I think that is true. Yes, I think that is, that is true. But, you know, particularly the kind of, for my grandchildren, and I have to meet them because they're the people I know best, and we, you'll know young people as well. You know, they're lovely boys, but they basically had everything they wanted in life. Thank God they've not been spoiled. They remained thoroughly decent, nice people, but, you know, they've had everything they wanted in life. It's absolutely, you know, the most people in the world, you know, just don't do that. That's not how most people people are. Uh, and you, you know, you do wonder, you know, what's going to happen with, you know, people in that kind of position when they come across, you know, a very different kind of world. I think, I'm sure you're right that some people do have the gift of storytelling uh, and that people who have that gift should use that gift in, 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 in sermons. Um, it's not a, a, a technique I myself use very much. I suppose what I feel perhaps even more passionately about is that in any form of Christian communication, uh, the preacher or the communicator should be as aware as they can of the kind of objections which people will feel to what they're saying. To not assume, you know, that people are sharing the assumptions behind this kind of of, dis of discourse. Doesn't mean to say that they have to sort of agonise over a lot of with a lot of personal doubt from the pulpit and things which are totally in inappropriate. And nor, 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 nor should it be done as a kind of form of Christ, overt Christian apologetics. But, but people should be aware of the kind of things that people are feeling or objecting to about the Christian faith. And they, they, can, be, they can be addressed, but in a very surreptitious kind of way. And sometimes it might be also through the use of story, but that's one of the things I feel very strongly uh, about all forms of Christian faith. I don't think enough preachers actually do that. Uh, when you know, when or don't ask themselves that kind of question before they, they you know they prepare what they say. Well, I think we need to be in dialogue, don't we? We need to be in dialogue. I mean, great influence on my life was Joseph McCulloch, who rebuilt St Mary Le Beau uh, after the Second World War, and he had had it rebuilt quite deliberately, not with one pulpit, with two pulpits, so that the church could be in in dialogue with the rest of the world. And Robert Stopford, who was Bishop of London at, uh, uh, at that time, was a very, very dry old stick, but like a lot of dry old sticks, had a very wonderfully dry sense of humour. He once said about Joseph McCulloch, about McCulloch oh, one link with the outside world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he, he did actually engage with, with, with what was going on in the culture. And that's what we, we've got to do. Well, the, 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 the ones who are Christians are, are certainly writing out of a shared tradition, 
but sometimes a rather different one. I mean, Eliot was writing out very much of a, a Catholic and Anglican, Anglican Catholic uh, position, you know, a very different, very clear one. Uh, Marilyn Robinson is also writing for a very clear one, but a very interestingly different one from the standpoint of the great Reformation reformers. I mean, Marilyn Robinson is highly critical of American religion, both in its evangelical form and its liberal form. She says that you've got to rediscover the great uh, reformers, and she, people like Calvin. She made me think very hard again about Calvin. You know, I've always been rather scared of Calvin, because we, you know, we, we imbibe so many stereotypes of evil. I bought the stereotypes. She shows that actually there's a great deal more there, and we need actually to look there. So, uh, but not all the writers, and most of the writers in the book I've read are Christians, but, but some of them are not, and some of them are anti Christian, uh, like Philip Pullman. One of the most interesting is Samuel Beckett, um, uh, and the, the, the title of the book, funny enough, comes from him. There's a friend of mine who, as a young man, produced a lot of Beckett plays, got to know Beckett very well. And he said to me once, uh, Samuel Beckett, he said he was, he was a Christ-haunted man, a secular mystic. And that's actually where my title comes from. And if you look at a play like Waiting for God, it's steeped in Christian imagery not in order to justify it, but rather to, un to, to as it were, to uh, un undermine it, but it's still there, he's still, he's still haunted by, by, by that. So, so I'd say the Christians broadly are within the, uh, within the same category, but are different, different shades of Christianity, uh, but others are writing from a different standpoint. Thank you. I just wanted to close, Richard, by um, referring to two bits from your book. One is the quote which you sort of referred to already, uh, in your introduction, you say, so much of the language we use is recycled cliché, the linguistic sludge of a lazy culture. <laughs> and I uh, just wanted to thank you on behalf of all of us that your profundity in the book and in what you've said to us is a long way away from the linguistic sludge of a lazy culture, but actually asking us to look at that and engage with it. And the other was to comment about us together and also about you in the words that you quote from Gerard Manley Hopkins. I am all at once what Christ is, since he was what I am. And this Jack, joke, poor potsherd, patch, matchwood, immortal diamond is immortal diamond. And that sense of how we are both broken and yet have this immortal soul that longs for God, this diamond that is within, is something that comes over very strongly in your book, but also in you and in the career that you've had over very many years. And thank you so much for sharing with us some of the fruits of your reflections and explorations in this book and in this session together. Thank, thank you. you very much. But it's been very, very nice to be with you. It's been enjoyable. I say in my, in my in, in, I mentioned in, my, in my, my, the introduction to my uh, book that uh, 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 at school, my housemaster used to come round every night, knocking on the doors of the dormitory to make sure we were all working. He invariably found me in bed, <laughs> gone to bed early reading a novel, and he invariably poked his head round the door and said, my boy, why aren't you working? And that's Iggy Spur. So this, and I say in my introduction, this book is a tribute to not working. <laughs> <laughs>